Welcome to yet another episode of Shortcast Over Coffee. The year was 1945 and the computer Mark I had played a key role in World War II. Officer Grace Hopper had worked on Mark I and had authored three papers. While working on the next version, Mark II, in 1947, she found a moth inside the computer and coined the term debugging, still used in engineering today. She was also the brain behind the computer language, COBOL. Fast forward to 1994, almost two years after her death, a conference by her name was born. The Grace Hopper Celebration for Women in Computer Science, or GHC for short, has grown on to become one of the largest conference in computer science. The attendance is expected to cross 30,000 this year. Today we have with us Dr. Telly Whitney, the co-founder of GHC, and a long-term CEO of the Anita Borg Institute. She has been quite a force in the industry, changing the trajectory of women in technology. In this interview, Dr. Whitney goes into the detail about her college career at the University of Utah and Caltech. She describes why she moved to Silicon Valley after graduation and the story behind GHC. Her passion for entrepreneurship is reflected throughout this interview, as she talks about how companies can promote diversity and inclusion in hiring and career progress. So without further ado, let's get on with the conversation. Thank you, Telly, for joining the podcast. I'm really delighted to be here. I'm looking forward to it. Your dad was a lawyer and mother a history teacher. And a little birdie told me that you joined the University of Utah to major in theater. How did a theater major eventually graduate with a degree in computer science and PhD from Caltech? Yeah, great question. So, yes, my dad was a corporate lawyer in Salt Lake City, and um, and I had no exposure to engineers when I was growing up. I really, I'm not even sure I knew what an engineer was, but I was very driven to do work where I could make a contribution. And so when I came to the University of Utah, I did start out in theater. It would, it did not go well. It was not a great fit. And I really tried a few other majors on for size, political science, psychology, things like English literature. But at some point, to be honest, I was actually pretty desperate. I, I wasn't sure where, what to study. I really wanted to study something where I could make a living at it. And so I took a test, a test that compared your answers to answers from a a bunch of different professions. They called it an interest inventory test. And at the time, computer programming came way ahead of everything else um, in my my responses. And so I I took a programming class and I fell in love, Lala, I mean, really in love. That's that's quite fascinating. Do you remember what that test was? Like, what did it entail? It was, was it uh, assertion reason type questions, multi choice? Um, You know, I have a copy of the test, but um, I'm not sure I know the rationale behind it. And I'm not sure it was very scientific. I mean, from this was a long time ago, (laughs) you've got to understand, but I I think that I really enjoyed logic and um, computer science looked a lot different when I first joined than you think of it today. I mean, the computer room, we used a big stack of cards. We turned them in, we got a listing. That's how you debug programming. It was very slow and very painful, but it was very fulfilling. I mean, very rewarding. And so I, and I started late. I mean, it took me a while to find it. So I was somewhere in my sophomore year. So I just studied and took math classes to computer science classes and loved it. I mean, I really enjoyed what I was doing. Just like fish to water. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. I was, I was reading a bit about uh, women in computer science and what I realized is that in the mid 18, 1980s, there were around 40 to 45% of the computer science majors were women. And the number dropped to around 20% in early 1990s. I think I think till about late 1990s when it started to pick up again. What was the situation when you went to college for computer science? And what do you 
why do you think the numbers dropped? Yeah, it's a um, good question. You've done your research. Um, I I do think, so computer science was not something that people fully understood. And to be honest, if you look at professions across the board, women are often, or I mean, in some sense, allowed to take on professions where men are not that interested. So it was attractive to men. It was attractive to women. You're right. It was close to 40% in the mid 80s, which is, I mean, a little bit after I was an undergraduate, but around that same time, a few things happened in that time period. I, I think perhaps the most significant was the, the PC came out in the early 80s. And not only did the PC come out, you know, a lot of people had them at home and games, computer games became very attractive. And so I think I believe a lot more boys um, had computer games in their household than their sisters did. And so I, I believe that, I mean, that's one of the factors. The departments were often in the engineering school. And so that, that also was not attractive to a lot of girls considering um, computer science as an undergraduate. So in the early 80s, I guess computer science was more mathematics and statistics, and then it shifted more to engineering. And now we see that it's moving back to mathematics and data science and whatnot, in a way. That's right. That's right. Um, I mean, I'll just give you one story of my good friend, Fran Allen, who was the first female fellow at IBM. She was a, comp she was a compiler person. And IBM had gone out and systematically looked for people, but particularly women who were good at math. And so they were inordinately good at hiring more women than most of their competitors. And I, I do think that that's what that's how many women were attracted to the discipline at that time. Do you recollect what people did after majoring in computer science? Um, IBM was big. It was huge, probably the only big name at the time. And I'm sure there were a lot of semiconductor companies, but it, was that it? OK, well, I graduated. So I graduated in 78. Um, there were lots of jobs. I mean, I had. You know, at the University of Utah, computer science, I had people, I mean, HP, IBM. Um, I actually went to work for Sperry Univac for a year um, in Salt Lake City. So there was, there was a lot of companies. These were all early computer companies that were desperate to hire people that had experience in computer science. And, and post PhD, you moved into the semiconductor industry from what I understand. Right. So, I mean, that's so when I got to Caltech and it was an exciting time, the VLSI revolution was happening. My thesis advisor was a man named Carver Mead and he and Lynn Conway, who is extraordinary, um, had developed a systematic approach to being able to design chips. And so you talked about semiconductors. I mean, at that time, um, it, there was a revolution happening. And I, I mean, I was a young student, so I didn't fully understand the impact of what was happening. But I mean, recently there's been a lot of coverage of TSMC and Morris Chang, which actually happened a few years later. These ideas that Carver and Lynn put together allowed students all over the country to develop designs in class, and then they could submit their designs and get them fabricated and then you could test out these designs. And I mean, TSMC made a business out of that approach. And in fact, some of the early people who were designing when I was a graduate student, or actually when I was first in Silicon Valley, Jim Clark, who started um, Netscape. I mean, there was just a lot of people who took these ideas of specialized processors and made them real. It was a very exciting time. Much akin to what you see right now with AI. Yeah. And that was the time when Silicon Valley was the actual Silicon Valley. Yeah. So when I got my PhD, I mean, I, I did interview all over the country, but I, I loved the idea of being in Silicon Valley. I mean, it was a very attractive place to be. So I moved up here. I actually started at a research lab, but that's not my fit. I'm an entrepreneur. I mean, I really love to create ideas and products from scratch. That's what, what keeps me excited, keeps me engaged. And so I worked at a couple of startups. One was a place called Actel, 
which made field programmable data arrays. And this is programmable logic where you could create a design, you have this vision of a design and you could actually take their program, their devices and program them in your lab. So then you could try it out very quickly. So that's, this whole FPGA was a fantastic idea. I joined, I was about employee number 30 and um, I stayed there for a while. I went to, a, then went to a much smaller startup called Malleable Technologies. And we were creating a programmable processor, but we, the product we created was for a voice over IP processor. And it was, um, I mean, I was employee number four, I was the head of engineering. It was just a very exciting time. In a year and a half, we created a working chip, software, programming software, and, um, and product engineering. So a lot, it was, and it was a lot of fun, very fulfilling. And all along the process, I'm pretty sure you met some great people, some great mentors. Um, yes. I, so when I moved to Silicon Valley, I was, I had been very tired of being the only woman at Caltech in graduate school. And so I really did set out to meet other women. Most of the people I worked at during my early years in Silicon Valley were all men, but I did go um, set out to meet women. And I met several women through the Stanford. There was a women in computing community that was coming out of Stanford. And, um, and through a friend of a friend at a Halloween party, in fact, I met a woman named Anita Borg. Who, so Anita had just moved here from New York City. She'd just gotten, well, she had been out for a while, but she had a PhD from NYU. And, um, and I mean, I knew many women at the time, but Anita and I became very close friends. So you met Anita at a Halloween party. How did you and Anita realize that you need to do something about it? Do you remember the first conversation about forming something or doing something about it? Right, I mean, I think that we started simple. Um, we we actually did first just organized dinners where women who we had met, this, like I said, through the Stanford Women's Program, we would have dinner and we would talk about things. And we would talk about I mean, activist con ideas and how to have a difference and what it was like to be a woman in computing and all kinds of ideas. Um, Anita, had also gotten involved with a number of national programs to bring more women into computer science. And so she had become involved with something called CRA, which is the Computing Research Association, which most universities that have a computer science department, a research computer science department still belong to today. And they had a committee on the status of women. And so she had listened to a few conversations and um, about the need for such a thing. We were close friends and so we just had some ideas about what, well, what could you do? And um, as I said, I'm an entrepreneur. There's nothing that's more fulfilling than creating something from scratch. So we took this idea of having a conference by women for women and decided to do it without knowing anything about creating a conference. but. We had a number of organizations step up. I mean, CRA agreed to be the fiscal sponsor. So that was great. We had the National Science Foundation um, provided scholarship money for students to attend. So we had very large organizations that were supporting this. So it started off as sisters? Well, sisters had already been in existence. And Anita founded that. I was not very involved with sisters, but she and about 12 other women went to a systems conference. I mean, her background, just like I was semiconductors, um, Anita came out of the systems world. And so there was about I've heard, between seven and 12 women who were at a conference and there was just not very many one of them. And so in the bathroom, they decided to have dinner together that night. So they had this big conference dinner and all the women at the conference sat at the same table. And from that, Sisters was, was founded. It was a collective idea, um, but what Anita did was she agreed to be the moderator. So she, it really was important at that time to keep, in order to keep conversation on track, somebody just paid attention to that. And that's what Anita did with Sisters. 
and then you started the grace hopper celebration for a for a women in computing conference or a celebration i don't think there is any better name but i just want to know what is there a story behind the name um or just a tribute to the greatest probably the earliest women computer scientists of all time right well at the time so this was in the early 90s grace hopper had just passed away very recently and so um she was top of mind and um so we started by this idea of having a conference and reaching out to most of the very senior women. And these were mostly academics and researchers at the, for the initial conference. And all of them agreed to talk at that first conference. Then, I mean, we did think about what name to use and Grace Hopper did seem like an obvious choice because she had had such an impact on the computing discipline. How did you go about advertising or letting people know that, hey, we have come up with this really exciting sort of a setup that that can be that can be that can do wonders uh, for women in tech? At the first conference, we had about 500 people. And at that time, I mean, it was really mostly the academic community. So because CRA was behind us, they could advertise to all of their membership. ACM is a, is one of the professional societies of the computing professional and they they helped us you know set up the hotel contracts and things like that and they advertised to their membership. So we actually had networks that were able to get the word out. It was um I think a fair I mean I probably over half maybe even two thirds of that first conference were students. So the NSF provided some scholarships, but many universities said you know, encouraged their students to attend. And um, from those early days, I mean, really what it, 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 we saw was that it had this huge impact on young students as they were just beginning to think about what do I want to do? You know, one of the fun things is over the years, I've met many women who attended those that first conference as a student and I've heard some of the stories about how it impacted their life and how they felt that oh my goodness I am not alone the moment I posted that I would be talking to you many people messaged me saying that I'm so grateful for this conference that I got my first job or you know I got to network from this conference and so on so how fantastic but but listening to you talk it feels almost like the moment you decided to start something, uh, everyone welcomed it with op open arms. We had a lot of support for the idea. I mean, not everybody. It's, um, you know, the biggest issues we had in the early conferences is that women, you've got to understand that when you're a woman and you're one of the only women in the room, um, you don't necessarily like to be singled out. And you want to be recognized for your technical contributions. And so many women in those first conferences had, were very ambivalent about attending. They didn't like this idea of an all-women conference. The universities, the, the companies, they were always behind us. Um, we actually had corporate support from the very first conference. I mean, not a lot. We had probably maybe five companies that were sponsors. But... They, they, they liked the idea. They wanted to support it. Uh, it was a number of years before we actually, it became such a recruiting platform. I mean, I think for the first few conferences, all the sponsors had tables. So you could talk, you know, if Intel was there, you could go talk to an Intel recruiter. But mostly it was about having the chance to talk to other women pretty counterintuitive that women who wanted to participate were ambivalent about it, but the companies jumped in. I, some of what I, the reasons why you still see today, I mean, women, I mean, there are many women CEOs, I'm thinking of Meg Whitman and um, Carly Fiorini, who were very ambivalent about talking about the fact that they were a woman CEO. They wanted to be recognized as a great CEO. 
full stop. And I mean, as a computer scientist, I, I know that feeling. I mean, you want to be recognized for your contribution. So it's not it's not that unusual even today for some people. Now, at this point, I know a lot more about what the social science says that um, being able to, to uh, see role models and have in, can have a huge impact on what you do. And, um, and so that's, I do think that that's what Grace Hopper over time was able to do. So the initial years of Grace Hopper celebration was just women coming together to talk about their work or did they present something at the conference or were they were there keynote addresses how, how was the structure like initially you know the first conference was all one one session for the most part it was two days of talks technical talks i mean they were all technical talks for those two days and they were mostly academic researchers i mean I don't, do you know what the Turing Award is? It's the, yeah, it's really, it's the okay. Nobel Prize in computer science. Yeah, that's right. Well, so there's been about four women who have got have received the Turing, oh, Turing Award, and all four of them were at that, or were supposed to speak at that first Grace Hopper celebration. So a lot of people who have had huge impact said yes. Um, I do think, I mean, it, it stayed relatively small for the first few times. We held it every three years initially because it was a lot of work <laughs> and it was all volunteer. But then we went to every two years um, and then we went to every year. And it, it you know, women would come. There was, from the very beginning, there was the chance to, um, to come together with a community. So we had birds, what they called at the time, birds of a feather, which is just small groups. We had a lesbian community. We had um, a, a Latinx, what we are, well, what we call now Latinx community. So there was groups that came together, but I mean, so for, I'll just give you one story. This woman I know who is a CTO in Silicon Valley, she, who is, is Latina. Um, she, she has a PhD from MIT and she was very ambivalent about coming to the conference because once again, being singled out as a woman was not what she um, really wanted to do. She wanted to contribute. She finally went and she met all these other people that she, that, that had a similar background. And in fact, out of that, the time when they came together, they formed something called Latinas in Computing. And um, have, it, that's a community that still exists today. So it's, there was the talks, there were the communities, and then there, was, there were workshops. There were people who came who gave workshops on particular topics. How did it move from sort of a celebration of women in tech to, I mean, it still is, but how did it move to more of a recruiting? It was just companies pouring in with support. Good question. Um, you know, sometimes um, conferences take on a life of their own. Um, we we mod we grew modestly for quite a few years, and um, people came, and there was some recruiting, but it was not a big deal. I mean, we had numbers about twenty five hundred and maybe three thousand. What happened? I mean, initially, companies came with their recruiters, and um, they were the only people to attend. So for example, Facebook might come with five recruiters, but then it became a place where companies would take some of their women. And a lot of the growth came as we had, we, we, we always had a lot of students that attended and we had some ac academics, but then more and more we had women who worked in industry who would also come and that fueled the growth. You know, these things, change over time. And as at first companies came and they weren't quite sure what to do, but then they started developing their own diversity recruiting strategy. And then Grace Hopper became a part of what they were doing. And um, and that's where it sits today. Well, that's great. Um, people who have heard you talk would already know about what you call the pipeline. Uh, just for my listeners, could you elaborate a bit about what you mean by the pipeline? Oh, well, 
different people mean different things. But I do think that if you look at, if you really take this idea of ha having women at the table creating technology, 50-50, as Anita would say, by, by 2020, which didn't happen. <laughs> but you often have to start in um, grammar school that, that girls and boys, you want them to be excited by the idea of science and technology. And so there's a lot of programs that really embrace technology and computing and engineering at the grammar school and middle school and high school um, level. One of the boards that I still serve on is something called AI for All. And we are very interested in creating the next generation of AI leaders. And we started in high school. We also have programs that are working with college students, but it's really appealing to kids at a time when they are forming views of themselves and what's possible. And exposure to role models are um, is so important at that early time. It's, it doesn't stop with college though. I mean, one of the parts that has been a real challenge for me is you see all these bright, excited, women graduate with computer science degrees or something like that. And then they go to companies and they feel like they're the only. Um, and so often they will leave and they will go on and do other things. That has become better. Um, there are more women in companies, absolutely. Um, you see it more and more with some of the uh, you know, what, what I've always called underrepresented minorities, but somebody who is um, black, or a woman, a black woman, a Latina, um, somebody from the LGBTQ community. I mean, can you come out at work and not feel isolated? So it, it continues to be an issue, but we see more issues these days with what they call intersectionality, which are people that have multiple underrepresentation. So, so as, as we spoke, Grace Hopper celebration has started to be, uh, become really big uh, about recruiting as well. Uh, what do you think of the hiring process that that's going on these days uh, with the job posting? I know there have been some changes where employees have started to put salary ranges uh, and so on uh, along with the job postings. But where do you think the gaps are when it comes to hiring and what can change or what can improve? There are known ways to hire a very diverse workforce. And unfortunately, not all the companies that come and recruit at places like Grace Hopper follow the best practices. I mean, I can give you some, some examples of things you really need to worry about. As you think about job postings, um, you need to really think about the language that you're using to describe a job. If you know, Grace Hopper is a little different because all the attendees of the conference know that the companies that are at Grace Hopper are looking to hire more women. I mean, that's actually why they are there. But what I've observed is that many companies, they have a, a hit list of the schools that they hire from. Um, so that may be 10 schools, the same 10 schools for most many companies. And they often will go to Grace Hopper and still seek out the students from those schools and not necessarily go after the widely diverse set of attendees that are attending the conference. One of the challenges as it's gotten larger and larger is it's become harder to just find that um, diamond in the rough. I mean, the, that person that went to perhaps a public university that may or may not appear, appear on your list of schools that is just really great and to interview them. And being more open to people from fairly diverse backgrounds to me is really important. Do you think education has become more democratized now and eventually in let's say 15 years, a college degree won't matter anymore? Oh, um, I do think, I mean, I've known too many people in my life that were really great that did not have a college degree. So it's it's really about how capable somebody is. And 
for many companies, they use a, the degree as a shortcut to be able to assess the qualities, the characteristics that will make them help them be successful. And um, I, I like this idea what you're talking about. It isn't a reality today. Um, there's a lot of coding camps. There's some pretty remarkable coding camps that have really tried to bridge that gap, that gap between the number of, of coders, at least, that um, companies want to hire and the number that are available on the market. They have had um, mixed success. I mean, I do think I have so, I've heard some wonderful stories about people that have gone through these coding camps and were hired as an intern at, at a company that supported the coding camps. And they, I mean, this goes back to the diamond in the rough. I mean, they found that these people were great and they eventually made them a full-time offer. But it requires a certain amount of attention and preparation to be able to hire people like that. And many recruiters and many recruiting firms take the shortcut. And the shortcut is really the, um, the you know, what, what school did you attend? You know, what is your degree? And they use that as code for what they are really looking for, which is really great talent. Yeah. In a sense, some things have changed. Um, like, for instance, someone applies for a job and the the company just sends them a coding assignment. And if you're good, it doesn't really matter what school you went to, and then you're pretty much considered for the next stage. So that way there has been some democratization, but yeah, there's a long way to go, I guess. Yes, I am. Um, and I do think that some companies have done that. I do think that that's becoming more common. I've heard too many stories of, you know, recent stories of students that, were cut off because they didn't have X, Y, or Z. So we've come away. And once again, some people are making, are approaching this in a very systematic way, like you described, and others are not. So zeroing in on Anita um, org, other than the Grace Hopper celebration, I think listeners would love to know what are the, what are some of the other things that uh, the organization is doing? I know you left the organization a while back, but uh, probably till the time that you were associated, what were some of the other things that, that the org, org was involved with? Well, certainly Grace Hopper Celebration is the best known program, but for many years before I left, I mean, I was very committed to working with organizations that to, to help them understand how do you create a diverse workforce? And so we had a number of programs for partner companies that where people could share best practices. There was something called the Technical Executive Forum where senior executives were able to come together and share practices with other people, you know, their peers to, to understand what makes a difference in terms of my organization. Because here's the, well, here's, Here's what I believe more than anything else. You know, it's many companies, they hire a diversity officer, they hire a set of recruiters, they go out and they, they, they you know, it's a scattershot approach. And the best people don't necessarily thrive in that kind of environment. But if you, if you take a step back and understand what kind of culture you're creating and how to to involve in, in, a, in an innovation phase, the best of all the people who are working for you, you have the opportunity to do it differently. I mean, companies that you, you talked about the democratization of innovation or engineering practices, that really means that for any particular product that at the table, that people can speak up, that they have a voice, that they can influence the outcome, and that the leaders make sure that those the people actually know that they are being listened to, that their ideas are valued. I think a lot of the times when companies hire DEI teams or DEI officers, I think a lot of the times they just focus on the diversity part 
and they forget about the inclusion part. Uh, that's been my observation over the years. Um, but I think inclusion will go a long way in creating, like you said, you know, every employee will have, um, will feel empowered. And it's not, you know, having a DEI person, I mean, there are some really talented people that are doing DEI work. So no question about it. But if you think about it, it's the leadership and the, you know, all the people who are creating products, they're making decisions on a, a daily basis that truly impact their workforce. And if they start with a diverse workforce, how, like you said, how do you encourage them to feel included? How do you ensure that they're listened to? And it's, it really isn't about HR or recruiting or DEI. It's the people who are doing this every day, making decisions that encourage the best ideas to be described, articulated, and then have an influence on the outcome. Okay. Yeah. And it's well proven that a diverse set of uh, employees from a diverse set of backgrounds do uh, bring a lot of innovation at, at any organization. So, But it takes work, Bala. I mean, that's there's some great articles about how, I mean, if, you, if everybody looks the same, it is often easier. I mean, because there's a comfort level when you're talking to people who have very similar backgrounds to you. You aren't going to get the best ideas. You aren't going to get the best outcomes. But taking an organization to be more diverse and ensuring that people who may disagree or where there might be conflict have a way to get through that and come out on the other end with better results, that's the dream. That's the dream. Yeah, and, and talking about uh, women in computer science or in, in STEM, there has been historically a lot of statistics that a quota system does work but how do we bridge the gap between hiring with quota system in mind versus hiring merit right great question so i mean if you go to europe i mean if you they do they did create a quota system for their board and it really does work and there are many places that show it works it's not, I mean, if you look at America, we just don't, quotas don't sit well with us. It's, I mean, pretty much across the board um, because it feels, it just feels wrong. I mean, it's part of our probably inherent culture. I am, um, Silicon Valley is reputed to be a meritocracy. I mean, this, there are just some real icons here who believe that the best ideas come out on top. And if you take, if you talk to all the Silicon Valley folks that don't look like the standard people, you'd find that none of them believe that it's a meritocracy. And so it's not, it's not so easy to make decisions strictly on merit. You need to fully understand the ways in which you hear ideas, that your own, I mean, biases come up, come out, and you shut down conversations before they ever really happen. So it is a lot of work to truly get to um, making decisions based on merit. And it takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of what they sometimes call EQ, but understanding what value each of your team members could could add to the resulting product. Well, um, I think this is a perfect way to end the podcast as well. Uh, I would want to know from you, if you were to give out shout out to companies that have done significant amount of work to to actually make a difference and to include more women in tech and actually succeeded in doing so. If you were to give out, give a shout out to companies, would you be okay naming them or probably give some examples? Um, so it's a little tricky to be able to um, talk about specific companies, um, but I can give some examples that, that um, of companies that I have observed that have changed over time, especially. Uh, so for example, in the Intel of my youth, um, 
was a very, you know, be, it was all male, all white shirts. I mean, very kind of like IBM. Um, but they have really approached their diversity in an engineering way and have had made a huge difference in terms of promoting a fairly diverse set of people to um, to, to engineering executives. Um, so I really have admired some of the work that Intel has done over time. I um, There was a company called GoDaddy that had a horrific reputation um, because of their ads, their Super Bowl ads that um, featured women. And so women just despised them. My board thought I was crazy to when we started working with them, but they had a new CEO and they really did. They worked with a group out of Stanford. They systematically looked at the way they hired and promoted and really made a difference. And you can go online and find um, a number of articles that really talk about that. Um, Microsoft has made, I mean, Satya Nadella came to spoke at um, Grace Hopper and he, he took a lot of flack because he really, I don't know if you remember that, but he- Women I mean, should not ask for races, right? right. <laughs> and, um, but he took the feedback seriously and he went on to really create a very inclusive culture. It took a number of years, but he has really made a huge change Microsoft. I think the part that I, my dream for the future is in Silicon Valley, we have this whole startup ecosystem. And unfortunately, all too many of them still have a pretty bro culture. So increasing the number of companies that include female founders, which is still woefully underfunded. Um, but that's where the opportunity for creating a whole different way of doing business really sit. You're pretty optimistic about the future of GHC. It it has grown leaps and bounds over the years. So it seems, I mean, I'm attending this year, I'm attending virtually. Um, it's people love it. I mean, they really, it, it, it changes their life. I mean, I had this job where I had all these young women coming up to me and saying, this changed my life. And it was, it, I mean, yes, it is known as a recruiting conference, but it's also the chance to see these other remarkable women that made a huge difference. So at least for now, it seems to be doing really well. And you know, Brenda, the, the, the CEO now, she has created this whole new members ecosystem, which I think is doing quite well. So people have access to all kinds of programs year round. And I do think that that can be very rewarding. Well, uh, Telly, uh, I can't say how, what an honor it has been to talk to you. Um, you have been a champion in your field and you have inspired so many people and you continue to inspire people. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's nice to talk to you, Baba. That was Dr. Telly Whitney. I will be back with another guest next time. Till then, peace. Mm -hmm.